Chapter Six of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy. Chapter Six. She is peevish, sullen, forward, proud, disobedient, stubborn, lacking duty, neither regarding that she is my child nor fearing me as if I were her father. Shakespeare. A day or two of bright, breezy weather had succeeded the storm, and another squantum had been arranged for. It was to be a more pretentious affair than the former one, other summer visitors uniting with our party, and a different spot had been selected for it. By Violet's direction, the maid had laid out, the night before, the dresses the two little girls were to wear to the picnic, and they appeared at the breakfast table, already attired in them, for the start was to be made shortly after the conclusion of the meal. The material of the dresses was fine. They were neatly fitting and prettily trimmed but rather dark in color and with high necks and long sleeves, altogether suitable for the occasion, and far from unbecoming, indeed, as the captain glanced at the two neat little figures, seated one on each side of him. He felt the risings of fatherly pride in their attractiveness of appearance. An even exacting, discontented Lulu was well enough pleased with her mamma's choice for her, till, upon leaving the table and running out for a moment into the street, to see if the carriages were in sight, she came upon a girl about her own age, who was to be of the company, very gaily apparelled in thin white tarlatan and pink ribbon. "'Good morning, Sadie,' said Lulu. "'What a nice day for the squantum, isn't it?' "'Yes, and it's most time to start, and you're not dressed yet, are you?' Glancing a trifle scornfully from her own gay plumage to Lulu's plainer attire. The latter flushed hotly, but made no reply. "'I don't see anything of the carriages yet,' was all she said. Then darting into the cottage occupied by their family, she rushed to her trunk, and throwing it open, hastily took from it a white muslin, coral ribbons and sash, and with headlong speed tore off her plain-colored dress, and arrayed herself in them. She would not have had time, but for an unexpected delay in the arrival of the carriage, which was to convey her parents, brother and sister, and herself to the squantum ground. As it was, she came rushing out at almost the last moment, just as the captain was handing his wife into the vehicle. Max met her before she had reached the outer door. Lou, Mama Vi says you will need a wrap before we get back, probably even going, and you're to bring one along. I shan't need any such thing, and I'm not going to be bothered with it, cried Lulu in a tone of angry impatience, hurrying on toward the entrance as she spoke. Phew! What have you been doing to yourself? exclaimed Max, suddenly noting the change of attire, while Grace, standing in the doorway, turned toward them with a simultaneous exclamation. Why, Lulu! Then broke off, lost in astonishment at her sister's audacity. Hush, both of you! Can't you keep quiet? snapped Lulu, turning from one to the other. Then as her father's tall form darkened the doorway, and a glance up into his face showed her that it was very grave and stern, she shrank back abashed, frightened by the sudden conviction that he had overheard her impertinent reply to her mamma's message, and perhaps noticed a change in her dress. He regarded her for a moment in silence, while she hung her head in shame and affright, and he spoke in tones of grave displeasure. "'You will stay at home today, Lulu. We have no room for disrespectful, disobedient children.' "'Papa,' she interrupted, half pleadingly, half angrily, "'I haven't been disobedient or disrespectful to you.' "'It is quite the same,' he said. I require you to be obedient and respectful to your mamma. An impertinence to her is something I will by no means allow or fail to punish whenever I know of it. Sorry as I am to deprive you of an anticipated pleasure, I repeat that you must stay at home and go immediately to your room and resume the dress she directed you to wear today. So saying, he took Grace's hand and led her to the carriage, Max following after one regretful look at Lulu's sorely disappointed face. Grace, Clinging about her father's neck as he lifted her up, pleaded for her sister. Oh, Papa, do please let her go. She hasn't been naughty for a long while, and I'm sure she's sorry and will be good. Hush, hush, darling, he said, wiping the tears from her eyes, then placing her by Violet's side. What is wrong? inquired the latter with concern. Is Gracie not feeling well? Never mind, my love, the captain answered, assuming a cheerful tone. There is nothing wrong except that Lulu has displeased me and I have told her she cannot go with us today. Oh, I am sorry, Violet said, looking really pained. We shall all miss her. I should be glad, Levis, if you could forgive her for... 
no do not ask it he said hastily adding with a smile of ardent affection into the azure eyes gazing so pleadingly into his i can scarcely bear to say no to you dearest but i have passed sentence upon the offender and cannot revoke it the carriage drove off the others had already gone and lulu was left alone in the house the one maid-servant left behind having already wandered off to the beach there cried lulu stamping her foot with passion then dropping into a chair i say it's just too bad she isn't old enough to be my mother and i won't have her for one i shan't mind her papa had no business to marry her he hardly cares for anybody else now and he ought to love me better than he does her for she isn't a bit of relation to him while i'm his own child i shan't wear dowdy old womanish dresses to please her along with the other girls of my size that are dressed up in their best i'd rather stay at home than be mortified that way and i just wish i had told him so she was in so rebellious a mood that instead of at once changing her dress in obedience to her father's command she presently rose from her chair walked out at the front door and paraded through the village streets in her finery saying to herself i'll let people see that i have some decent clothes to wear returning after a little she was much surprised to find betty johnson stretched full length on a lounge with a paper coupled novel in her hand which she seemed to be devouring with great avidity why betty she exclaimed are you here i thought you went with the rest of the squantum just what i thought in regard to your highness returned betty glancing up from her book with a laugh i stayed at home to enjoy my book in the bath what kept you papa lulu answered with a frown he wouldn't let me go because you put on that dress i presume laughed betty well it's not very suitable that's a fact but i had no idea the captain was such a connoisseur in matters of that sort he isn't he doesn't know or care if it wasn't for mamma vi burst out lulu vehemently and she's no business to dictate about my dress either i'm old enough to judge and decide for myself really it is a great pity that one so wise should be compelled to submit to dictation observed betty with exasperating irony lulu returning a furious look which her tormentor feigned not to see then marched into the adjoining room gave a tardy obedience to her father's orders and then the dress are you going in this morning asked betty when lulu had returned to the little parlor i don't know papa didn't say whether i might or not then i should take the benefit of the doubt and follow my own inclination in the matter it's ten now the bathing hour is eleven i shall be done my book by that time and we'll go in together if you like i'll see about it lulu said walking away she went down to the beach and easily whiled away an hour watching the waves and the people and digging in the sand when she saw the others go into the bath houses she hastened back to her temporary abode as she entered betty was tossing aside her book so here you are she said yawning and stretching herself are you going in yes if papa is angry i'll tell him he should have forbidden me if he didn't want me to do it they donned their bathing suits and went in with the crowd but though no mishap befell them and they came out safely again lulu found that for some reason her bath was not half so enjoyable as usual she and betty dined at the hotel where the family had frequently taken their meals and they strolled down to the beach and seated themselves on a bench under an awning after a while betty proposed taking a walk where to asked lulu to sankety lighthouse well i'm agreed it's a nice walk you can look out over the sea all the way said lulu getting up but a sudden thought seemed to strike her she paused and hesitated well what's the matter queried betty nothing only papa told me i was to stay at home today. oh nonsense what a little goose exclaimed betty of course that only meant you were not to go to the squantum so come along lulu was by no means sure that that was really all her father meant but she wanted the walk so suffered herself to be persuaded and they went betty had been a wild ungovernable girl at school glorying in contempt for rules and daring larks she had not improved in that respect and so far from being properly ashamed of her wild pranks and sometimes really disgraceful frolics liked to describe them and was charmed to find in lulu a deeply interested listener it was thus that they amused themselves as they strolled slowly along the bluff toward sankety when they reached there a number of carriages were standing about the near entrance several visitors were in the tower and others were waiting their turn let's go up too betty said to her little companion the view must be finer to-day than it was when we were here before for the atmosphere is clear i'm afraid papa wouldn't like me to objected lulu he seemed to think the other time that i needed him to take care of me she added with a laugh 
as if it were quite absurd that one so old and wise as herself should be supposed to need of such protection pooh don't be a baby betty said i can take care of myself and you too come i'm going up and round outside too and i dare you to do the same poor proud lulu was one of the silly people who are not brave enough to refuse to do a wrong or unwise thing if anybody dares them to do it i'm not a bit afraid miss johnson you need not think that she said bridling and i can take care of myself i'll go come on then we'll follow close behind that gentleman and the keeper won't suppose we are alone returned betty leading the way lulu found the steep stairs very hard to climb without the help of her father's hand and reached the top quite out of breath betty too was panting but they presently recovered themselves betty stepped outside just behind the gentleman who had preceded them up the stairs and lulu climbed quickly after her frightened enough at the perilous undertaking yet determined to prove that she was equal to it but she had advanced only a few steps when a sudden rush of wind caught her skirts and nearly took her off her feet both she and betty uttered a cry of affright and at the same instant lulu felt herself seized from behind and dragged forcibly back and within the window from which she had just emerged it was the face of a stranger that met her gaze as she looked up with frightened eyes child he said that was a narrow escape don't try it again where are your parents or guardians that you were permitted to step out there with no one to take care of you lulu blushed and hung her head in silence betty who had followed her in as fast as she could generously took all the blame upon herself don't scold her sir she said it was all my doing i brought her here without the knowledge of her parents and dared her to go out there you did he exclaimed turning a severe look upon the young girl he was a middle-aged man of stern aspect suppose i had not been near enough to catch her and she had been precipitated to the ground from that great height how would you have felt i could never have forgiven myself or had another happy moment while i lived betty said in half tremulous tones i can never thank you enough sir for saving her she added warmly no nor i said the keeper i should always have felt that i was to blame for letting her go out but you were close behind sir and the other gentleman before and i took you to be all one party and of course thought you would take care of the little girl she has had quite a severe shock the gentleman remarked again looking at lulu who was very pale and trembling like a leaf you had better wait and let me help you down the stairs i shall be ready in a very few moments betty thanked him and said they would wait while they did so she tried to jest and laugh with lulu but the little girl was in no mood for such things she felt sick and dizzy at the thought of the danger she had escaped but a moment ago she made no reply to betty's remarks and indeed seemed scarcely to hear them she was quite silent too while being helped down the stairs by the kind stranger but thanked him prettily as they separated you are heartily welcome he said but if you will take my advice you will never go needlessly into such danger again with that he shook hands with her bowed to betty and moved away "'Will you go in and rest a while, Lou?' asked Betty. "'No, thank you. I'm not tired, and I'd rather be close by the sea. "'Tell me another of your stories, won't you, to help me forget how near I came to falling?' "'Betty good-naturedly complied, but found Lulu a less interested listener than before. "'The squantum party were late in returning, and when they arrived Betty and Lulu were in bed, "'but the door between the room where Lulu lay and the parlor, or sitting-room as it was indifferently called, "'was ajar, and she could hear all that was said there.' "'Where is Lulu?' her father asked of the maid-servant, who had been left behind. "'Gone to bed, sir,' was the answer. Then the captain stepped through the chamber door, pushed it wider open, and came to the bedside. Lulu pretended to be asleep, keeping her eyes tight shut, but all the time feeling that he was standing there and looking down at her. He sighed slightly, turned away, and went from the room. Then she buried her face in the pillows and cried softly but quite bitterly. He might have kissed me, she said to herself. He would if he loved me as much as he used to before he got married. Then his sigh seemed to echo in her heart, and she grew remorseful over the thought that her misconduct had grieved as well as displeased him, and how much more grieved and displeased he would be if he knew how she had disregarded his wishes and commands during his absence that day. And soon he would be ordered away again, perhaps to the other side of the world, in danger from the treacherous deep and maybe from savages too, in some of those faraway places where his vessel would touch, and so the separation might be for years or forever in this world, and if she continued to be the bad girl, she could not help acknowledging to herself she was now. How dared she hope to be with her Christian father in another life? 
She had no doubt that he was a Christian. It was evident from his daily walk and conversation, and she was equally certain that she herself was not. And what a kind, affectionate father he had always been to her. She grew more and more remorseful as she thought of it, and if he had been beside her at that moment, would certainly have confessed all the wrongdoing of the day and asked forgiveness. But he was probably in bed now, all with darkness and silence in the house. So she lay still and presently forgot all vexing thought in sound, refreshing sleep. When she woke again, the morning sun was shining brightly and her mood had changed. The wrongdoings of the previous day were the merest trifles, and it would really be quite ridiculous to go and confess them to her father. She supposed, indeed was quite sure, that he would be better pleased with her if she made some acknowledgment of sorrow for the fault which he had punished her. But the very thought of doing so was so galling to her pride that she was stubbornly determined not to do anything of the kind. She was thinking it all over while dressing, and trying hard to believe herself a very ill-used instead of naughty child. It was a burning shame that being scolded and left behind for such a trifling fault. But she would let Papa and everybody else see that she didn't care. She wouldn't ask one word about what kind of a time they had had. She hoped it hadn't been so very nice. And she would show Papa, too, that she could do very well without caresses and endearments from him. Glancing from the window, she saw him out on the bluff, back on the cottage. But though her toilet was now finished, she did not, as usual, run out to put her hand in his, and with a glad good morning hold up her face for a kiss. She went quietly to the dooryard, looking upon the village street, and peeped into the window of the room where Grace was dressing, with a little help from Agnes, their mamma's maid. "'Oh, Lou, good morning!' cried the little girl. "'I was so sorry you weren't with us yesterday at the Squantum. We had ever such a nice time. Only I missed you very much.' "'Your sympathy was wasted, Grace,' returned Lulu with a grand air. "'I had a very pleasant time at home.' "'Dar, now, you's done finished, Miss Gracie,' said Agnes, turning to leave the room. Then she laughed to herself as she went. "'Miss Lou, she needn't think she don't deceive nobody with them grand airs of hers. "'Spec we all knows she's been glad enough to go if the captain didn't tell her she got too far to stay behind.' Grace ran out and joined her sister at the door. "'Oh, Lou!' "'You would have enjoyed it if you had been with us,' she said, embracing her. "'But we are going to have a drive this morning. "'We are to start as soon as breakfast is over, and only come back in time for the bath. "'And Papa says you can go, too, if you want to, and are a good girl, and you—' "'I don't want to,' said Lulu, with a cold, offended air. "'I like to be by myself on the beach. "'I enjoyed it very much yesterday, and shall enjoy it today. "'I don't need anybody's company.' "'Her conscience gave her a twinge as she spoke.' reminding her that she had passed but little of her day alone at the beach. Grace gazed at her with wide-open eyes, lost in astonishment at her strange mood, but hearing their father's step within the house, turned about and ran to meet him and claim her morning kiss. "'Where is your sister?' he asked, when he had given it. "'The little one is asleep, Papa,' she answered gaily. "'The other one is at the door there.' He smiled. "'Tell her to come in,' he said. "'We are going to have prayers.' Lulu obeyed the summons, but took a seat near the door, without so much as glancing toward her father. When the short service was over, Grace seated herself upon his knee, and Max stood close beside him, both laughing and talking right merrily. But Lulu sat where she was, gazing in moody silence into the street. At length, in a pause in the talk, the captain said, in a kindly tone, "'One of my little girls seems to have forgotten to bid me good morning.' "'Good morning, Papa,' muttered Lulu sullenly her face still averted. "'Good morning, Lucilla,' he said, and she knew by his tone and use of her full name that he was by no means pleased with her behavior. At that moment they were summoned to breakfast. Lulu took her place with the others and ate in silence, scarce lifting her eyes from her plate, while everybody else was full of cheerful chat. A carriage was at the door when they left the table. "'Make haste, children,' the captain said, "'so that we may have time for a long drive before the bathing hour.' Max and Grace moved promptly to obey, but Lulu stood still. "'I spoke to you, Lulu, as well as to the others,' her father said, in his usual kindly tone. "'You may go with us if you wish.' "'I don't care to, Papa,' she answered, turning away. "'Very well. I shall not compel you. You may do just as you please about it,' he returned. "'Stay at home if you prefer it. You may go down to the beach if you choose, but nowhere else.' "'Yes, sir,' she muttered and walked out of the room, wondering in a half-frightened way if he knew or suspected where she had been the day before.' In fact, he did neither. He believed Lulu a more obedient child than she was, and had no idea that she had not done exactly as he bade her. This time she was so far obedient 
that she went nowhere except to the beach, but while wandering about there she was nursing unkind and rebellious thoughts and feelings, trying hard to convince herself that her father loved her less than he did his other children, and was more inclined to be severe with her than with them. In her heart of hearts she believed no such thing, but pretending to herself that she did, she continued her unlovely behavior all that day and the next, sulking alone most of the time, doing whatever she was bidden, but with a sullen air, seldom speaking unless she was spoken to, never hanging lovingly about her father as had been her wont, but rather seeming to avoid being near him whenever she could. It pained him deeply to see her indulging so evil a temper, but he thought best to appear not to notice it. He did not offer her the caresses she evidently tried to avoid, and seldom addressed her, but when he did speak to her, it was in his accustomed kind fatherly tones, and it was her own fault if she did not share in every pleasure provided for the others. In the afternoon of the second day, they were all gathered upon the beach as usual, when a young girl, who seemed to be a newcomer in Sconset, drew near and accosted Betty as an old acquaintance. "'Why, Anna Eastman, who would have expected to see you here?' cried Betty, in accents of pleased surprise, springing up to embrace a stranger. Then she introduced her to Elsie, Violet, and Captain Raymond, who happened to be sitting near, as an old school friend. "'And you didn't know I was on the island?' remarked Miss Eastman laughingly to Betty, when the introductions were over. "'I hadn't the least idea of it. When did you arrive?' "'Several days since. Last Monday, and this is Friday. By the way, I saw you on Tuesday, though you did not see me.' "'How and where?' asked Betty in surprise, not remembering at the moment how she had spent that day. "'At Sanctity Lighthouse. I was in a carriage out on the green in front of the lighthouse, and saw you and that little girl yonder, nodding in Lulu's direction, come out on the top of the tower, and a puff of wind took the child's skirts, and I fairly screamed with fright, expecting to see her fall and be crushed to death. But somebody jerked her back within the window, just in time to save her. "'Weren't you terribly frightened, dear?' she asked, addressing Lulu. "'Of course I was,' Lulu answered in an ungracious tone, and rose and sauntered away along the beach. "'What did she tell it for, hateful thing?' she muttered to herself. "'Now Papa knows it. What will he say and do to me?' She had not ventured to look at him. If she had, she would have seen his face grow suddenly pale, then assume an expression of mingled sternness and pain. He presently rose and followed her, but she did not know it till he had reached her side, and she felt him take her hand in his. He sat down, making her sit by his side. "'Is this true that I hear of you, Lulu?' he asked. "'Yes, Papa,' she answered in a low and willing tone, hanging her head as she spoke, for she dared not look him in the face. "'I did not think one of my children would be so disobedient,' he said in pained accents. "'Papa, you never said I shouldn't go to Sanctity Lighthouse,' she muttered. "'I never gave you leave to go, and I have told you positively more than once that you must not go to any distance from the house without express permission.' Also, I am sure you could not help understanding, from what was said when I took you to the lighthouse, that I would be very far from willing that you should go up into the tower, and especially outside, unless I were with you to take care of you. Besides, what were my orders to you just as I was leaving the house that morning? You told me to change my dress immediately and to stay at home. Did you obey the first order? Lulu was silent for a moment. Then, as her father was evidently waiting for an answer, she muttered, I changed my dress after a while. That was not obeying. I told you to do it immediately, he said in a tone of severity. What did you do in the meantime? I don't want to tell you, she muttered. You must, and you are not to say you don't want to do what I bid you. What were you doing? Walking round the town, breaking two of your father's commands at once. What next? Give me a full account of the manner in which you spent the day. I came in soon and changed my dress then went to the beach till the bathing hour, then Betty and I went in together, then we had our dinner at the hotel, and came back to the beach for a little while, then we went to Sanctity. Filling up the whole day with repeated acts of disobedience, he said. Papa, you didn't say I mustn't go in to bathe, or that I shouldn't take a walk. I told you to stay at home, and you disobeyed that order again and again, and you have been behaving very badly ever since, showing a most unamiable temper. I have overlooked it, hoping to see a change for the better in your conduct without my resorting to punishment. But I think the time has now come when I must try that with you. He paused for some moments, wondering at his silence. She at length ventured a timid look up into his face. It was so full of pain and distress that her heart smote her, and she was seized with a sudden fury at herself as a guilty cause of his suffering. Lulu, 
he said with a sigh that was almost a groan. "'What am I to do with you?' "'Whip me, Papa,' she burst out. "'I deserve it. You've never tried that yet, and maybe it would make me a better girl. I almost wish you would, Papa,' she went on in her vehement way. "'I could beat myself for being so bad and hurting you so.' He made no answer to that, but presently said in moved tones, "'What if I had come back that night to find the dear little daughter I'd left a few hours before in full health and strength, lying a crushed and mangled corpse, killed without a moment's time to repent of her disobedience to her father's known wishes and commands. Could I have hoped to have you restored to me, even in another world, my child? No, Papa, she said, half under her breath. I know I wasn't fit to go to heaven, and that I'm not fit now, but would you have been really very sorry to lose such a bad, troublesome child? Knowing that, as you yourself acknowledge, we're not fit for heaven, it would have been the heaviest blow I have ever had, he said. My daughter, you are fully capable of understanding the way of salvation. Therefore, are an accountable being, and, so long as you neglect it, in danger of eternal death. I shall never be easy about you, till I have good reason to believe that you have given your heart to the Lord Jesus, and devoted yourself entirely to his blessed service. He ceased speaking, gave her a few moments for silent reflection, then setting her on her feet, rose, took her hand, and led her back toward the village. Are you going to punish me, Papa? she asked presently, in a half-frightened tone. I shall take that matter into consideration, was all he said, and she knew from his grave accents that she was in some danger of receiving what she felt to be her deserts. End of chapter 6 Recording by Amy Chapter 7 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy Chapter 7 The Rod and Reproof Give Wisdom but a child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. Proverbs twenty nine fifteen. Lulu hated suspense. It seemed to her worse than the worst certainty. So when they had gone a few steps farther, she said, hesitating and blushing very deeply, Papa, if you are going to punish me as, as I said I most wished you would, please don't let Mamma Vi or anybody know it, and... Certainly not. It shall be a secret between our two selves, he said, as she broke off without finishing her sentence. "'If we can manage it,' he added a little doubtfully. "'They all go down to the beach every evening, you know, Papa,' she suggested in a timid, half-hesitating way, and trembling as she spoke. "'Yes, that would give us a chance, but I have not said positively that I intend to punish you in that way.' "'No, sir, but, oh, do please say certainly that you will or you won't.' The look he gave her as she raised her eyes half-fearfully to his face was very kind and affectionate though grave and judicial. "'I am not angry with you,' he said, "'in the sense of being in a passion or out of patience, not in the least. "'But I feel it to be my duty to do all I possibly can "'to help you to be a better child, "'and noticing, as I have said, "'for the last two or three days "'what a willful, wicked temper you were indulging. "'I have been considering very seriously "'whether I ought not to try the remedy you have yourself suggested, "'and I am afraid I ought indeed. "'Do you still think, as you told me a while ago, that this sort of punishment might be a help to you in trying to be good? Lulu hesitated a moment, then said impetuously, and as if determined to own the truth, though it were to pass sentence upon herself, Yes, Papa, honestly I do, though I don't want you to do it one bit. But, she added, I shan't love you any less if you'd whip me ever so hard, because I shall know you don't like to do it, and wouldn't except for the reason you've given. No, indeed, I should not, he said. "'but you are to stay behind tonight when the others go to the beach.' "'Yes, Papa, I will,' she answered submissively, "'but with a perceptible tremble in her voice. "'Grace and Max were coming to meet them, "'so there was no opportunity to talk any more on the subject, "'and she walked on in silence by her father's side, "'trying hard to act and look as if nothing was amiss with her, "'clinging fast to the hand in which she had taken hers, "'while Grace took possession of the other. "'You ought to have three hands, Papa,' laughed Max, a little ruefully. Four corrected Grace, for some day little Elsie will be wanting one. I shall have to manage it by taking you in turn, the captain said, looking down upon them with a fatherly smile. Violet and some of the other members of their party were still seated where they had left them on the beaches, under the awning just out of reach of the waves, and thither the captain and his children bent their steps. Sitting down by his wife's side, he drew Grace to his knee and Lulu close to his other side, keeping an arm round each while chatting pleasantly with his family and friends. 
Lulu was very silent, constantly asking herself, and with no little uneasiness, what he really intended to do with her when, according to his direction, she should stay behind with him after tea, while the others returned to the beach. One thing she was determined on, that she would, if possible, obey the order without attracting anyone's notice. Everybody must have seen how badly she had been behaving, but the thought of that was not half so galling to her pride as the danger of suspicion being aroused that punishment had been meted out to her on account of it. Max watched her curiously and took an opportunity on their return to the house to say privately to Lou, "'I'm glad you've turned over a new leaf, Lou, and begun to behave decently to Papa. I've wondered over and over again in the last few days they didn't take you in hand in a way to convince you that he wasn't to be trifled with. It's my opinion that if you'd been a boy, you'd have got a trouncing long before this.' "'Indeed!' she cried, with an angry toss of her head. "'I'm glad I'm not a boy, if I couldn't be one without using such vulgar words.' "'Oh, that isn't such a very bad word,' returned Max, laughing. "'But I can tell you from sad experience that the thing is bad enough sometimes. "'I'd be quaking in my shoes if I thought Papa had any reason to consider me deserving of one.' "'I don't see what you mean by talking so to me,' exclaimed Lulu passionately. "'But I think you are a Pharisee, making yourself out so much better than I am.' The call to supper interrupted them just there, and perhaps saved them from a downright quarrel. Lulu had no appetite for the meal, and it seemed to her that the others would never have done eating, then that they lingered unusually long about the house, before starting for their accustomed evening rendezvous, the beach, for she was on thorns all the time. At last someone made a move, and catching a look from her father, which she alone saw or understood, she slipped unobserved into her bedroom, and waited there with a fast-beating heart. She heard him say to Violet, "'Don't wait for me, my love. I have a little matter to attend to here, and will follow you in the course of half an hour.' "'Anything I can help you with?' Violet asked. "'Oh, no, thank you,' he said. "'I need no assistance.' "'A business letter to write, I presume,' she returned laughingly. "'Well, don't make it too long, for I grudge every moment of your time.' With that she followed the others, and all was quiet, except for the captain's measured tread, for he was slowly pacing the room to and fro, impatient impetuous lulu did not know how to endure the suspense she seemed to herself like a criminal awaiting execution softly she opened the door and stepped out in front of her father stopping him in his walk papa she said with pale trembling lips looking beseechingly up into his face whatever you are going to do to me won't you please do it at once and let me have it over he took her hand and sitting down drew her to his side putting his arm around her my little daughter he said very gravely, but not unkindly. My responsibility in regard to your training weighs very heavily on my mind. It is plain to me that you will make either a very good and useful woman, or one who will be a curse to herself and others, for you are too energetic and impulsive, too full of strong feeling to be lukewarm and indifferent in anything. You are forming your character now for time and for eternity, and I must do whatever lies in my power to help you form it aright, for good and not for evil. You inherit a sinful nature from me, and of very strong passions, which must be conquered, or they will prove your ruin. I fear you do not see the great sinfulness of their indulgence, and that it may be that I am partly to blame for that, in having passed too lightly over such exhibitions of them as have come under my notice. In short, that perhaps if I had been more justly severe with your faults, you would have been more thoroughly convinced of their heinousness, and striven harder and with greater success to conquer them. Therefore, after much thought and deliberation, and much prayer for guidance and direction, I have fully decided that I ought to punish you severely for the repeated acts of disobedience you have been guilty of in the last few days, and the constant exhibition of ill temper. It pains me exceedingly to do it, but I must not consider my own feelings, where my dear child's best interests are concerned. Is it because I asked you to do it, Papa? she inquired. I never thought you would when I said it. "'No, I have been thinking seriously on the subject, "'ever since you behaved so badly the day of the squantum, "'and had very nearly decided the question, "'just as I have fully decided it now. "'I know you are an honest child, "'even when the truth is against you. "'Tell me, do you not yourself think that I am right?' "'Yes, sir,' she answered low and tremulously, "'after a moment's struggle with herself. "'Oh, please do it at once, it will be over soon.' "'I will,' he said, rising and leading her into the inner room. "'You shall not have the torture of anticipation a moment longer.' Though the punishment was severe beyond Lulu's worst anticipations, she bore it without outcry or entreaty, feeling that she richly deserved it, and determined that no one who might be within hearing should learn from any sound she uttered what was going on. 
tears and now and then a half-suppressed sob were the only evidences of suffering that she allowed herself to give her father was astonished at her fortitude and more than ever convinced that she had in her the elements of a noble character the punishment was over he took her in his arms laying her head against his breast both were silent her tears falling like rain at length with a heart-broken sob you hurt me terribly papa she said i didn't think you would ever want to hurt me so i did not want to he answered in moved tones it was sorely against my inclination i cannot tell you how gladly i should have borne twice the pain for you if so i could have made you a good girl i know you have sometimes troubled yourself with foolish fears that you had less than your fair share of my affection but i have not a child that is nearer or dearer to me than you are my darling i love you very much i am so glad papa i most wonder you can she sobbed and i love you dearly dearly i know i have not been acting like it lately but i do and just as much now as before oh papa you don't know how hard it is for me to be good i think i do he said for i am naturally quite as bad as you are having a violent temper which would most certainly have been my ruin had i not been forced to learn to control it indeed i fear it is from me you get your temper i had a good christian mother he went on who was very faithful in her efforts to train her children up aright my fits of passion gave her great concern and anxiety i can see now how troubled and distressed she used to look usually she would shut me up in a room by myself until i had time to cool down then come to me talk very seriously and kindly of the danger and sinfulness of such indulgence of temper telling me there was no knowing what dreadful deed i might some day be led to commit in my fury if i did not learn to rule my own spirit and that therefore for my own sake she must punish me to teach me self-control she would then chastise me often quite severely and leave me to myself again to reflect upon the matter thus she finally succeeded in so convincing me of the great guilt and danger of giving rein to my fiery temper and the necessity of gaining the mastery over it that i fought hard to do so and with god's help have i think gained the victory it is the remembrance of all this and how thankful i am to my mother now for her faithfulness that has determined me to be equally faithful to my own dear little daughter though unfortunately i lack the opportunity for the same constant watchfulness over my children oh papa if you only could be with us all the time she sighed but i never thought you had a temper i've seen some people fly at their naughty children in a great passion and beat them hard i should think if you had such a bad temper as you say you'd have treated me so many a time very likely i should if your grandmother had not taught me to control it he said you may thank her that you have as good a father as you have i think i have the best in the world she said putting her arm around his neck and now that it's all over papa i'm glad you did punish me just so hard for i don't feel half so mean because it seems as if i have sort of paid for my naughtiness toward you yes toward me the account is settled between us but remember that you cannot so atone for your sin against god nothing but the blood of christ can avail to blot out that account against you and you must ask to be forgiven for his sake alone we will kneel down and ask it now violet glanced again and again toward the cottages on the bluff wondering and a trifle impatient at her husband's long delay but at length saw him approaching leading lulu by the hand there was unusual gravity amounting almost to sternness in his face and lulu's wore a more subdued expression than she had ever seen upon it while traces of tears were evident upon her cheeks he has been talking very seriously to her in regard to the ill temper she has shown during the past few days violet said to herself poor wayward child i hope she will take the lesson to heart and give him less trouble and anxiety in the future he kept lulu close at his side all the evening and she seemed well content to stay there her head on his shoulder his arm around her waist while she listened silently to the talk going on around her or to the booming of the waves upon the beach not many yards away when it was time for the children to retire he took her and grace to the house at the door he bent down and kissed grace good night saying i shall not wait to see you in your bed but shall come in to look at you before i go to mine may i have a kiss too papa lulu asked in a wishful half tremulous voice as though a trifle uncertain whether her request would be granted yes my dear little daughter as many as you wish he replied taking her in his arms and bestowing them with hearty good will and affection i'm sorry oh very sorry for all my naughtiness papa she whispered in his ear while clinging about his neck it is all forgiven now he said and i trust will never be repeated lulu was very good submissive and obedient during the remainder of her father's stay among them she was greatly distressed when two weeks later 
orders came for him to join his ship the following day she clung to him with devoted remorseful affection and distress in prospect of the impending separation while he treated her with even more than his wonted kindness drawing her often caressingly to his knee and his voice taking on a very tender tone whenever he spoke to her it was in the evening he left them for he was to drive over to nantucket town and pass the night there in order to take the early boat leaving for the mainland the next morning mr dinsmore went with him intending to go to boston for a few days perhaps on to new york also then returned to see us harold herbert bob and max set out that same evening for their camping ground so that mr edward travilla was the only man of the party left to take care of the women and children however they would all have felt safe enough in that very quiet spot or anywhere on the island without any such protection lulu went to bed that night full of remorseful regret that through her own wilfulness she had lost many hours of her father's prized society besides grieving and displeasing him oh if she could but go back and live the last few weeks over how differently she would behave she would not give him the least cause to be displeased with or troubled about her as often before she felt a great disgust at herself and a longing desire to be good and gentle like gracie who never seemed of the slightest inclination to be quick-tempered or rebellious she's so sweet and dear murmured lulu half aloud and reaching out a hand to softly touch the little sister sleeping quietly by her side i should think papa would love her ten times better than me but he says he doesn't and he always tells the truth i wish i'd been made like gracie but i'm ever so glad he can love me in spite of all my badness oh i am determined to be good the next time he's at home so that he will enjoy his visit more it was a burning shame in me to spoil this one so i'd like to beat you for it lulu raymond and i'm glad he didn't let you escape violet and her mother were passing the night together and lying side by side talked to each other in loving confidence of such things as lay near their heart naturally Vi's thoughts were full of the husband from whom she had just parted for how long it might be months or years mamma she said the more i am with him and study his character the more i honor and trust and love him it is the one trial of my otherwise exceptionally happy life that we must pass so much of our time apart and that he has such a child as lulu to mar his enjoyment of oh dear daughter interrupted elsie do not allow yourself to feel otherwise than very kindly toward your husband's child lulu has some very noble traits and i trust you will try to think of them rather than of her faults serious as they may seem to you yes mamma there are some things about her that are very lovable and i really have a strong affection for her even aside from the fact that she is his child yet when she behaves in a way that distresses him i can hardly help wishing that she belonged to someone else you surely must have noticed how badly she behaved for two or three days he never spoke to me about it tried not to let me see that it interfered with his enjoyment for he knew that that would spoil mine but for all that i knew his heart was often heavy over her misconduct yet she certainly does love her father how she clung to him after she had heard that he must leave us so soon with a remorseful affection it seemed to me yes and though she shed but a few tears in parting from him i could see that she was almost heartbroken she is a strange child but if she takes the right turn will assuredly make a noble useful woman i hope so mamma and that will i know repay him for all his care and anxiety on her account no father could be fonder of his children or more willing to do or endure anything for their sake of course i do not mean anything wrong he would not do wrong himself or suffer wrongdoing in them for his greatest desire is to see them truly good real christians i hope my darling as she grows older will be altogether a comfort and blessing to him as her mother has been to me and always was to her father elsie responded in loving tones thank you mamma violet said with emotion oh if i had been an undutiful daughter and given pain and anxiety to my best of fathers how my heart would ache at the remembrance now that he has gone and i feel deep pity for lulu when i think what sorrow she is preparing for herself in case she outlives her father as in the course of nature she is likely to do yes poor child sighed elsie and doubtless she is even now enduring the reproaches of conscience aggravated by the fear that she may not see her father very soon again she and gracie to say nothing of my dear vi will be feeling lonely to-morrow and edward zoe and i have planned various little excursions by land and water to give occupation to your thoughts and pleasantly while away the time you are always so kind dearest mamma said violet always thinking of others and planning for their enjoyment oh how lonely it does seem without papa our dear dear papa was gracie's waking exclamation 
I wish he could live at home all the time, like other children's fathers do. When will he come again, Lulu? I don't know, Gracie. I don't believe anybody knows, returned Lulu sorrowfully. But you've no occasion to feel half as badly about it as I. Why not? cried Grace, a little indignantly, even her gentle nature, aroused at the apparent insinuation that he was more to Lulu than to herself. You don't love him a bit better than I do. Maybe not, but Mamma Vi is more to you than she is to me, so that wasn't what I was thinking of. I was only thinking that you had been a good child to him all the time he has been at home, while I was so very, very naughty that... Lulu broke off suddenly and went on with her dressing in silence. That what? asked Grace. That I grieved him very much and spoiled half his pleasure, Lulu said in a choking voice. Then, turning suddenly toward her sister, her face flushing hotly, her eyes full of tears, bitterly ashamed of what she was moved to tell, yet with a heart aching so for sympathy that she hardly knew how to keep it back. Greasy, if I tell you something, will you never, never, never breathe a single word of it to a living soul? Grace, who was seated on the floor, putting on her shoes and stockings, looked up at her sister in silent astonishment. Come, answer, exclaimed Lulu impetuously. Do you promise? I know if you make a promise, you'll keep it. But I won't tell you without, for I wouldn't have Mamma Vi or Max or anybody else but you know, for all the world. Not Papa? Oh, Gracie, Papa knows. It's a secret between him and me. Only, only I have a right to tell you if I choose. I'm glad he knows, because I couldn't promise not to tell him if he asked me and said I must. Yes, I promise, Lulu. What is it? Lulu had finished her dressing, and dropping down on the carpet beside Grace, she began, half averting her face and speaking in low, hurried tones. You remember that morning we were all going to the squantum? I changed my dress and put on a white one, and because of that and something I said to Max that Papa overheard, he said I must stay at home, and he ordered me to take off that dress immediately. While I disobeyed him, I walked around the town in the dress before I took it off, and instead of staying at home, I went in to bathe and took a walk in the afternoon with Betty Johnson to Sankaty Lighthouse, and went up in the tower and outside, too. Oh, Lulu! cried Grace. How could you dare to do so? I did anyway, said Lulu, and you know I was very ill-tempered for two days afterward, so when Papa knew it all, he thought he ought to punish me, and he did. How? Oh, Grace, don't you know? Can't you guess? It was when he and I stayed back while all the rest went to the beach that evening after Betty's friend told of seeing me at Sankety. Grace drew a long breath. Oh, Lou, she said pityingly, putting her arms lovingly about her sister. I am so sorry for you. How could you bear it? Did he hurt you very much? Oh, yes, terribly, but I'm glad he did it, though I wouldn't for anything let anybody know it but you, because I'd feel so mean if I hadn't paid somehow for my badness. Papa was so good and kind to me. He always is, and I have been behaving so hatefully to him. And he wasn't in a bit of a passion with me, I believe. As he told me, he did hate to punish me, and only did it to help me to learn to conquer my temper. And to be obedient, too? Yes, the punishment was for that, too, he said. But now, don't you think I have reason to feel worse about his going away just now than you? Yes, admitted Grace. I'd feel ever so badly if I had done anything to make dear Papa sad and troubled and I think I should be frightened to death if he was going to whip me. No, you wouldn't, said Lulu, for you would know Papa wouldn't hurt you any more than he thought necessary for your own good. Now let me help you dress, for it must be near breakfast time. Oh, thank you, yes, I'll have to hurry. Do you love Papa as well as ever, Lou? Better, returned Lulu emphatically. It seems odd, but I do. I shouldn't, though, if I thought he took pleasure in beating me or punished me in any way. I don't believe he likes to punish any of us said Grace. I know he doesn't, said Lulu, and it isn't any odder that I should love him in spite of his punishments, and that he should love me in spite of all my naughtiness. Yes, I do think, Gracie, we have the best father in the world. Of course we have, responded Grace, but then we don't have him half the time. He's most always on his ship, she added tearfully. Are you ready for breakfast, dears? asked a sweet voice at the door. Yes, Grandma Elsie, they answered, hastening to claim the good morning kiss. She was always ready to bestow. Lulu's heartache had drawn some relief in her confidence to her sister, and she showed a pleasanter and more cheerful face at the table than Violet expected to see her wear. It grew brighter still when she learned that they were all to have a long, delightful drive over the hills and moors, starting almost immediately upon the conclusion of the meal. The weather was charming, everybody in the most amiable mood, and in spite of the pain of the recent parting from him, whom they so dearly loved, that would occasionally make itself felt 
in the hearts of wife and children. The little trip was an enjoyable one to all. Just as they drew up at the cottage door on their return, a blast of Captain Baxter's tin horn announced his arrival with the mail, and Edward, waiting only to assist the ladies and children to alight, hurried off to learn if they had any interest in the contents of the mailbag. End of chapter 7 Recording by Amy Chapter 8 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy Chapter 8 Be not too ready to condemn The wrongs thy brothers may have done Ere ye too harshly censure them For if human faults ask Have I none? Miss Eliza Cook The little girls took up their station at the front door To watch for Uncle Edward's return Gracie presently cried out joyfully, "'Oh, he's coming with a whole handful of letters. "'I wonder if one is from Papa.' "'I'm afraid not,' said Lulu. "'He would hardly write last night, "'leaving us so late as he did, "'and hardly have time before the leaving "'of the early boat this morning.' "'The last word had scarcely left her lips "'when Edward reached her side "'and put a letter into her hand. "'A letter directed to her, "'and unmistakably in her father's handwriting.' "'One for you, too, Vi,' he said gaily, tossing it into her lap through the open window. "'Excuse the unceremonious delivery, sister mine. "'Where are Grandma and Mamma? I have a letter for each of them.' "'Here,' answered his mother's voice from within the room, then as she took the missives from his hand. "'Ah, I knew Papa would not forget either Mamma or me.' "'Where's my share, Ned?' asked Zoe, issuing from the inner room, where she had been engaged in taking off her hat.' and smoothing her fair tresses. Your share? Well, really, I don't know, unless you'll accept the mail carrier as such, he returned sportively. Captain Baxter, she asked in mock astonishment. I'd rather have a letter by half. But you can't have either, he returned laughing. You can have the postman who delivered the letters here. Nothing more. Yours is Hobson's choice. Lulu, receiving her letter with a half-smothered exclamation of intense joyful surprise, ran swiftly away with it to the beach, never stopping till she had gained a spot beyond and away from the crowd, where no prying eye would watch her movements, or note if the perusal of her treasure caused any emotion. There, seated upon the sand, she broke open the envelope with fingers trembling with eagerness. It contained only a few lines in Captain Raymond's bold chirography, but they breathed such fatherly love and tenderness as brought the tears in showers from Lulu's eyes, tears of intense joy and filial love. She hastily wiped them away and read the sweet words again and again, then kissing the paper over and over, placed it in her bosom, rose up, and slowly wended her way back toward the house, with a lighter, happier heart than she had known for some days. She had not gone far when Grace came tripping over the sands to meet her, her face sparkling with delight as she held up a note to view, exclaiming, See, Lou, Papa did not forget me. It came inside of Mamma's letter. Oh, Gracie, I am glad, said Lulu. But it would be very strange for Papa to remember the bad child and not the good one, wouldn't it? She concluded between a sigh and a smile. I'm not always good, said Grace. You know I did something very, very bad last winter one time. Something you would never do. I believe you'd speak the truth if you knew you'd be killed for it. You dear little thing, exclaimed Lulu, throwing her arm round Grace and giving her a hearty kiss. It's very good in you to say it, but Papa says I'm an honest child and own the truth, even when it's against me. Yes, you t said you told him how you had disobeyed him, and if it had been I, I wouldn't have ever said a word about it for fear he'd punish me. Well, you can't help being timid, and if I were as timid as you are, no doubt I'd be afraid to own up too. And I didn't confess till after that Miss Eastman had told on me, said Lulu. Now let's sit down in the sand, and if you'll show me your letter... I'll show you mine. Grace was more than willing, and they busied themselves with the letters, reading and rereading, and with loving talk about their absent father, till summoned to the supper table. Lulu was very fond of being on the beach, playing in the sand, wandering hither and thither, or just sitting gazing dreamily out over the waves, and her father had allowed her to do so, only stipulating that she should not go out of sight, or into any place that looked at all dangerous. I'm going down to the beach, she said to Grace when they had left the table that evening. Won't you go, too? 
not yet said grace baby is awake and looks so sweet and i'd rather stay and play with her a little while first she does look pretty and sweet assented lulu glancing toward the babe cooing in its nurse's arms but we can see enough of her after we go home to ion and haven't to see any more i'll go now and you can come and join me when you are ready leaving the house lulu turned southward toward sunset heights and strolled slowly on gazing seaward for the most part and drinking in with delight the delicious breeze as it came sweeping on from no one knows where tearing the crests of the waves and scattering the spray hither and yon the tide was rising and it was keen enjoyment to watch the great billows chasing each other in and dashing higher and higher on the sands below when the sun drew near his setting and the sea reflecting the gorgeous coloring of the clouds changed every moment from one lovely hue to another lulu walked on and on wilfully refusing to think how great might be the distance she was putting between herself and home and at length sat down the better to enjoy the lovely panorama of cloud and sea which still continued to enrapture her with its ever-changing beauty by and by the colors began to fade and give the place to a whole silvery gray which gradually deepened and spread till the whole sky was fast growing black with clouds that even to her inexperienced eye pretended a storm she started up and sent a sweeping glance around her on every side could it be possible that she was so far from the tiny sconset cottage that at present she called home here were tom never's head and the life-saving station almost close at hand she had heard papa say they were a good two miles from sconset so she must be very nearly that distance from home all alone too and with night and a storm fast coming on oh me i've been disobedient again she said aloud as she set off for home at her most rapid pace what would papa say it wasn't exactly intentional this time but i should not have been so careless alarmed at the prospect of being overtaken by darkness and tempest alone out in the wild she used her best efforts to move with speed but she could scarcely see to pick her steps or take a perfectly direct course and now and again she was startled by the flutter of an affrighted night-bird across her path as she wandered among the sand dunes toiling over the yielding soil the booming of the waves and the melancholy cadences of the wind as it rose and fell filling her ears she was a brave child entirely free from superstitious fears and having learned that the island harbored no burglars or murderers and that there was no wild beast upon it her only fear was of being overtaken by the storm or lost on the moors unable to find her way till daybreak but gaining the top of a sand hill the starlight gleam of sanctity light greeted her delighted eyes and with a joyful exclamation oh now i can find the way she sprang forward with renewed energy soon found the path to the village pursued it with quickened steps and light heart although the rain was now pouring down accompanied with occasional flashes of lightning and peals of thunder and in a few moments pushed open the door of the cottage and stepped into the astonished presence of the ladies of the party she had not been missed till the approach of the storm drove them all within doors then perceiving that the little girl was not among them the question passed from one to another where is lulu no one could say where grace remembered that she had gone out intending to take a stroll along the beach but did not mention in which direction and she has never been known to stay out so late and and the tide is coming in cried violet sinking pale and trembling into a chair oh mamma if she is drowned how shall i answer to my husband for taking so little care of his child my dear daughter don't borrow trouble elsie said cheerfully though her own cheek had grown very pale it was in my care he left her not in yours don't fret vi edward said i don't believe she's drowned she has more sense than to go where the tide would reach her but i'll go at once and look for her and engage others in the search also he started for the door she may be out on the moors ned called zoe running after him with his waterproof coat here put this on no time to wait for that he said but you must take time she returned catching hold of him and throwing it over his shoulders men have to obey their wives once in a while lou's not drowning don't you believe it and she may as well get a wetting as you grace hiding her head in violet's lap was sobbing bitterly the latter stroking her hair in a soothing way but too full of grief and alarm herself to speak any comforting words don't cry gracie and vi don't look so distressed said betty lulu like myself is one of those people that need never be worried about the bad pennies that always turn up again and she isn't fit for heaven remarked rosie in an undertone not meant for her sister's ear but i don't believe she added in a louder key that there's anything worse the matter 
and too long a walk for her to get back in good season. That is my opinion, Vi, said Mrs. Dinsmore, and Elsie added, mine also. No one spoke again for a moment, and in the silence the heavy boom-boom of the surf on the beach below came distinctly to their ears. Then there was a vivid flash of lightning, and a terrific thunder crash, followed instantly by a heavy downpour of rain. "'And she is out in all this!' exclaimed Violet in tones of deep distress. "'Dear child, if I only had her here, safe in my arms, or if her father were here to look after her!' "'And punish her,' added Rosie. "'It's my humble opinion that if ever a girl of her age needed a good whipping, she does.' "'Rosie,' said her mother with unwanted severity, "'I cannot allow you to talk in that way. "'Lulu's faults are different from yours, but perhaps no worse, "'for while she is passionate and not sufficiently amenable to authority, "'you are showing yourself both uncharitable and pharisaical.' "'Well, Mamma," Rosie answered, blushing deeply at the reproof, "'I cannot help feeling angry with her for giving poor Vi "'so much unnecessary worry and distress of mind, "'and I am sure her father must have felt troubled and mortified,' by the way she behaved for two or three days while he was here. "'But he loves her very dearly,' said Violet, "'so dearly that to lose her in this way would surely break his heart.' "'But I tell you, he is not going to lose her in this way,' said Betty in a lively tone. "'Don't you be a bit afraid of it.' But Violet could not share the comfortable assurance. To her it seemed more than likely Lulu had been too venturesome, and that a swiftly incoming wave had carried her off her feet and swept her in its recoil into the boiling sea." I shall never see the dear child again, was her anguished thought. And oh, what news to write to her father. He will not blame me, I know. But oh, I cannot help blaming myself that I did not miss her sooner and send someone to search for and bring her back. Elsie read her daughter's distress in her speaking countenance, and sitting down by her side, tried to cheer her with loving, hopeful words. Dear Vi, she said, I have a strong impression that the child is not lost and will be here presently. But whatever has happened, or may happen, stay your heart, dear one, upon your God. Trust him for the child, for your husband, and for yourself. You know that troubles do not spring out of the ground, and to his children he gives help and deliverance out of all he sends them. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. He shall deliver thee in six troubles, yea, in seven, there shall no evil touch thee. There was perhaps not more than a half hour of this trying suspense, between Edward's departure in search of the missing child and her sudden appearance in their midst. Sudden it seemed because the roar of the sea and howling of the storm drowned all other sounds from without and prevented any echo of approaching footsteps. Lulu! they all cried in varied tones of surprise and relief as they started up and gathered about her dripping figure. Where have you been? How wet you are! Oh, dear child, I am so glad and thankful to see you. I have been terribly frightened about you. This last from Violet. I, I didn't mean to be out so late, or to go so far, stammered Lulu, and I didn't see the storm coming up in time, and it caught and hindered me. Please, Mamma Vi, and Grandma Elsie, don't be angry about it. I won't do so again. We won't stop to talk about it now, Elsie answered for Violet and herself. Your clothes must be changed instantly, for you are as wet as if you'd been in the sea, and that with fresh water, so that there is great danger of your taking cold. I should think the best plan would be for her to be rubbed with a coarse towel till reaction sets in fully, and then put directly to bed, said Mrs. Dinsmore. If that is done, we may hope to find her as well in the morning, as if she had not had this exposure to the storm. Lulu made no objection, no resistance, being only too glad to escape so easily. Still, she was not quite sure that some punishment might not be in store for her on the morrow, and she had an uncomfortable impression that were it not for her father's absence, it might not be a very light one. When she was snugly in bed, Grandma Elsie came to her, bringing with her own hands a great tumbler of hot lemonade. Drink this, Lulu, she said in her own sweet voice, and with a loving look that made the little girl heartily ashamed of having given so much trouble and anxiety. It will be very good for you, I think, as well as palatable. Thank you, ma'am, Lulu said, tasting it. It is delicious, so strong of both lemon and sugar. I am glad you like it. Drink it all if you can, Elsie said. When Lulu had drained the tumbler, it was carried away by Agnes, and Grandma Elsie, sitting down beside the bed, asked, Are you sleeping, my child? If you are, we will defer our talk till tomorrow morning. If not, we will have it now. I'm not sleepy, Lulu answered, blushing and averting her face, adding to herself, I suppose it's got to come, and I'd rather have it over. 
you know my child that in the absence of your father and mine you are my care and i am responsible for you while you are accountable to me for your good or bad behavior such being the case it is now my duty to ask you to give an account of your whereabouts and doings in the hours that you were absent from us this evening lulu replied by an exact statement of the truth pleading an excuse for her escapade her father's permission to stroll about the beach even alone her enjoyment of the exercise of walking along the bluff and her absorbing interest in the changing beauty of sky and sea all which tended to render her oblivious of time and space so that on being suddenly reminded of them she found herself much farther from home than she had supposed was it not merely within certain limits you were given permission to ramble about the beach elsie asked gently yes ma'am papa said i was not to go far and i did not intend to indeed indeed grandma elsie i had not the least intention of disobeying but forgot everything in the pleasure of the walk and the beautiful sights do you think that is sufficient excuse and ought to be accepted as fully exonerating you from blame in regard to this matter i don't think people can help forgetting sometimes lulu replied a trifle sullenly i remember that in dealing with me as a child my father would never take forgetfulness of his orders as any excuse for disobedience and though it seemed hard then i have since thought he was right because the forgetfulness is almost always the result of not having deemed the matter of sufficient importance to duly charge the memory with it in the bible god both warns us against forgetting and bids us remember remember all the commandments of the lord and do them remember the sabbath day to keep it holy beware lest thou forget the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget god you see that god does not accept forgetfulness as a sufficient excuse or any excuse for sin then you won't of course muttered lulu carefully avoiding looking into the kind face bending over her how am i to be punished i don't feel as if anybody has a right to punish me but papa she added with a flash of indignant anger i heartily wish he were here to attend to it was the response in a kindly pitying tone but since unfortunately he is not and my father too is absent the unpleasant duty devolves upon me i have not had time to fully consider the matter but have no thought of being very severe with you and perhaps if you knew all the anxiety and sore distress suffered on your account this evening particularly by your mamma and little sister you would be sufficiently punished already did mamma vi care lulu asked in a half incredulous tone my child she was almost distracted elsie said she loves you for both your own and your father's sake besides as she repeated again and again she was sorely distressed on his account knowing his love for you to be so great that to lose you would well-nigh break his heart a flash of joy illumined lulu's face at this new testimony to her father's love for her but passed away as suddenly as it came i do feel punished in hearing that you are all so troubled about me grandma elsie she said and i mean to be very very careful not to cause such anxiety again please tell mamma vi i am sorry to have given her pain but she shouldn't care anything about such a naughty girl that my child she cannot help elsie said she loves your father far too well not to love you for his sake after a little more kindly admonitory talk she went away leaving a tender motherly kiss upon the little girl's lips at the door grace met her with a request for a good-night kiss which was promptly granted good night dear little one pleasant dreams and a happy awakening if it be god's will elsie said bending down to touch her lips to the rosebud mouth and let the small arms twine themselves around her neck good night dear grandma elsie responded the child oh aren't you ever so glad god brought our lulu safely home to us i am indeed dear let us not forget to thank him for it in our prayers to-night lulu heard and as grace's arms went round her neck the next moment and the sweet lips tremulous with emotion touched her cheek were you so distressed about me gracie she asked with feeling did mamma vi care so very much that i might be drowned yes indeed lou dear lou oh what could i do without my dear sister you know you have another one now suggested lulu that doesn't make any difference said grace she's the darling baby sister you are the dear dear big sister papa calls me his little girl remarked lulu half musingly and somehow i like to be little to him and big to you oh gracie what do you suppose he will say when he hears about to-night my being so bad and so soon after he went away too oh lou what made you because i was careless didn't think 
and I begin to believe that it was because I didn't choose to take the trouble. She sighed. I'm really afraid if Papa were here, I should get just the same sort of a punishment he gave me before. Gracie, don't you ever, ever tell anybody about that. No, Lou, I promised I wouldn't, but I should think you'd be punished enough with all the wetting and the fright. For weren't you most scared to death? No, I was frightened, but not nearly so much as that. Not so much as I should be if Papa were to walk in just now, because he'd have to hear all about it, and then he'd look so sorry and troubled, and punish me besides. And you wouldn't be glad to see Papa if he came back? Grace said in a reproachfully inquiring tone. Yes, I should, Lulu answered promptly. The punishment wouldn't last long, you know. He and I would both get over it pretty soon, and then it would be so delightful to have him with us again. Lulu woke the next morning feeling no ill effects, whatever, from her exposure to the storm. Before she and Grace had quite finished their morning toilet, Grandma Elsie was at their door, asking if they were well. She stayed for a little chat with them, and Lulu asked what her punishment was to be. "'Simply a prohibition of lonely rambles,' Elsie answered, with a grave but kindly look. "'And I trust it will prove all sufficient. You are to keep near the rest of us, for your own safety.'" End of chapter 8 Recording by Amy Chapter 9 of Elsie at Nantucket by Martha Finley This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Amy Chapter 9 He that spareth his rod hateth his son, but he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Proverbs 13.24 When the morning boat touched at Nantucket Pier, they were among the throng which poured ashore two fine-looking gentlemen, one in the prime of life, the other growing a little elderly, who sought out at once a conveyance to Sconset. The hackman had driven them before and recognized them with evident pleasure mingled with surprise. "'Glad to see you back again, Captain,' he remarked, addressing the younger of his two passengers. "'But it's kind of unexpected, isn't it? I understood you'd gone to join your ship, expecting to sail directly for foreign parts.' "'Yes, that was all correct,' returned Captain Raymond gaily for he it was, in company with Mr. Dinsmore. But orders are sometimes countermanded, as they were in this instant, to my no small content. They'll be dreadful glad to see you at Sconset, was the next remark. Surprise, too. By the way, sir, your folks had a fright last evening. A fright? inquired both gentlemen in a breath, and exchanging a look of concern. Yes, sir, it's about one of your little girls, Captain. The oldest one, I understood it was. It seems she'd wandered off alone to Tom Never's Head, or somewhere in that neighborhood and was caught by the darkness and storm, and didn't find her way home till the older folks had begun to think she'd been swept away by the tide, which was coming in, to be sure, but they thought it might have been the backward flow of a big wave that had rushed up a little too quick for her, taking her off of her feet and hurrying her into the surf before she could struggle up again. All the captain's gaiety was gone, and his face wore a pain troubled look. But she did reach home in safety at last, he said inquiringly. Oh, yes, all right except for a wetting, which probably did her no harm. "'But now maybe I'm telling tales out of school,' he added with a laugh. "'I shouldn't like to get the little girl into trouble, "'so I hope you'll not be too hard on her, Captain. "'I dare say the fright has been punishment enough "'to keep her from doing the like again.' "'I wish it may have been,' was all the captain said. "'Then he fell into a reverie so deep "'that he scarcely caught a word of a brisk conversation "'in regard to some of the points of interest in the island "'carried on between Mr. Dinsmore and the hackman. "'Lulu was having an uncomfortable day "'when she met the family at the breakfast table.' Grandma Rose seemed to regard her with cold displeasure. Mamma Vi spoke gently and kindly, hoping she felt no injury from last night's exposure, but looked wretchedly ill, and in answer to her mother's inquiries, admitted that she had been kept awake most of the night by a violent headache, to which Rosie added, in an indignant tone, and with an angry glance at Lulu, brought on by anxiety in regard to a certain young miss, who was always misbehaving and causing a world of trouble to her best friends. Rose, Rose, Elsie said reprovingly, let me hear no more such remarks, or I shall send you from the table. Lulu had appeared in their midst, feeling humble and contrite, and had been conscience smitten at the sight of her mamma's pale face. But the sneer on Betty's face, the cold, averted looks of Edward and Zoe, and then Rosie's taunt roused her quick temper to almost a white heat. She rose, and pushing back her chair with some noise, turned to leave the table which she had but just seated herself. What is it, Lulu? asked Grandma Elsie in a tone of gentle kindliness. Sit still, my child, and ask for what you want. Thank you, ma'am, said Lulu. I do not want anything but to go away. I'd rather do without my breakfast than stay here to be insulted. Sit down, my child, repeated Elsie, as gently and kindly as before. 
Rosie will make no more unkind remarks, and we will all try to treat you as we would wish to be treated were we in your place. No one else spoke. Lulu resumed her seat and ate her breakfast, but with little appetite or enjoyment, and on leaving the table tried to avoid contact with any of those who had caused her offense. "'May I go down to the beach, Grandma Elsie?' she asked, in low, constrained tones and with her eyes upon the floor. "'If you will go directly there to the seats under the awning, which we usually occupy, and not wander from them farther than they are from the cliff,' Elsie answered, "'promise me that you will keep within those bounds, and I shall know I may trust you, for you are an honest child.' The cloud lifted slightly from Lulu's brow at those kindly words. She gave the promise and walked slowly away. As she descended the stairway that led down the face of the cliff, she saw that Edward and Zoe were sitting side by side on one of the benches under the awning. She did not fancy their company just now, and knew hers would not be acceptable to them. She thought she would pass them and seat herself in the sand a little farther on. Edward was speaking as she came up behind them, and she heard him say, "'It was the most uncomfortable meal ever eaten in our family.' and all because of that ungovernable child. Lulu flushed hotly, and stepping past, turned and confronted him with flashing eyes. I heard you, Uncle Edward, she said, though I had no intention of listening, and I say it is very unjust to blame me so, when it was Rosie's insulting tongue and other people's cold, contemptuous looks that almost drove me wild. You are too much easily driven wild, he said. It is high time you learned to have some control over your temper. If I were your father, I'd teach it you, even if I must try the virtue of a rod again and again. Also, you should learn proper submission to authority, if it had to be taught in the same manner. Lulu was too angry to speak for a moment. She stood silent, trembling with passion, but at length burst out. It's none of your business how Papa manages me, Mr. Traveler, and I'm very glad he's my father instead of you. You're a very saucy girl, Lulu Raymond, said Zoe, reddening with anger on her husband's account, and shamefully ungrateful for all Mr. Traveler's kind exertions on your behalf last night. Hush, hush, Zoe, do not remind her of it, Edward said. A benefit upbraided forfeits thanks. I should have done quite the same for anyone supposed to be in danger and distress. What was it? asked Lulu. Nobody told me he had done anything. He was out for hours in all that storm hunting you, replied Zoe, with a proudly admiring glance at her husband. I'm very much obliged, said Lulu, her voice softening. And sorry you suffered on my account, she added. I did not suffer anything worth mentioning, he responded. But your mamma was sorely distressed, thinking you might be in the sea and in consequence had a dreadful headache all night. And since such dire consequences may follow from your disregard for rules and lawful authority, Lulu, I insist that you shall be more amenable to them. I believe you think that when your father and grandpa are both away, you can do pretty much as you please, but you shall not when I am about. I won't have my mother's authority set at defiance by you or anyone else. Who wants to set it at defiance? demanded Lulu wrathfully. Nor I, I am sure, but I won't be ruled by you, for Papa never said I should. I think I shall take down this conversation and report it to him, Edward said, only half in earnest. Lulu turned quickly away, greatly disturbed by the threat, but resolved that her alarm should not be perceived by either him or Zoe. Walking a few yards from them, she sat down upon the sand and amused herself digging in it. But with thoughts busied with the problem, what will Papa say and do if that conversation is reported to him? A very little consideration of the question convinced her that if present her father would say she had been extremely impertinent punish her for it, and make her apologize. Presently, a glance toward the cottages on the bluff showed her Violet and Grace descending the stairway. She rose and hurried to meet them. Mama Vi, she said, as soon as within hearing, I'm ever so sorry to have frightened you so last night and given you a headache, but you oughtn't to care whether such a naughty girl as I am is drowned or not. How can you talk so, Lulu, dear? Violet answered, putting an arm round the child's waist and giving her a gentle kiss. Do you think your Mama Vi has no real love for you? If so, you are much mistaken. I love you, Lulu, for yourself and dearly for your father's sake. Oh, I wish you loved him well enough to try harder to be good in order to add to his happiness. It would add to it more than anything else I know of. Your naughtiness does not deprive you of his fatherly affection, but it does rob him of much enjoyment which he would otherwise have. Lulu hung her head in silence, turned and walked away full of self-accusing and penitent thoughts. She was not crying. Tears did not come so readily to her eyes as to those of many children of her age, but her heart was aching with remorseful love for her absent father. To think that I spoiled his visit home, she sighed to herself. Oh, I wish he could come back to have it over again, and I would try to be good and not spoil his enjoyment in the very least. Come back now, something seemed to reply. Suppose he should. Wouldn't he punish you for your behavior since he left only two days ago? Yes, she sighed. I am at the least doubt that if he were here and knew 
all, he would punish me severely, and I suppose he wouldn't be long in the house before he would hear it all. Yet for all that, I should be, oh, so glad if he could come back to stay a good while. Last night's storm had spent itself in a few hours, and the morning was bright and clear. Yet a long drive planned for that day by our friends was unanimously postponed, as several of them had lost sleep, and wanted to make it up with a nap. Violet sought her couch immediately after dinner, slipped off the last remains of her headache, and about the middle of the afternoon was preparing to go down to the beach, where all the others were, except Grace, who was seldom far from Mama's side, when the outer door opened, and a step and voice were heard, which she had not hoped to hear again for months or years. The next moment she was in her husband's arms, her head pillowed on his breast, while his lips were pressed again and again to brow and cheek and lips, and Grace's glad shout arose in sweet, silvery tones, "'Papa has come back! Papa has come back! My dear, dear Papa!' "'Can it be possible, my dear, dear husband?' cried Violet, lifting to his a face radiant with happiness. "'It seems too good to be true.' "'Not quite so good as that,' he said with a joyous laugh. "'But it is quite a satisfaction to find that you are not sorry to see me.' "'Of which you were terribly afraid, of course,' she returned gaily. "'Do tell me at once how long our powers of endurance of such uncongenial society are to be taxed.' "'Ah, that is beyond my ability.' "'Then we may hope for weeks or months,' she said rapturously. "'Certainly we are not forbidden to hope,' he answered, smiling tenderly upon her. "'Oh, I am so glad,' she said with a happy sigh, leaning her head on his shoulder and gazing fondly up into his face, his right arm about her waist, while Grace clung to the other hand, holding it lovingly between her own and pressing her lips to it again and again. "'Ah, my darling little girl,' he said presently, letting Violet go to take Grace in his arms. "'Are you glad to see Papa back again so soon?' "'Oh, yes, indeed. Nothing else could have made me so very, very glad,' she cried, hugging him close and giving and receiving many tender caresses. "'But how did it happen, Levis? Violet was asking. "'There is some unlooked for change in the plans and purposes of the higher powers,' he answered lightly. "'My orders were countermanded, with no reasons given, and I may remain with my family till further orders. And, as you say, you will hope it may be months before they are received.' "'And you were glad to come back to us?' Violet said inquiringly but with not a shade of doubt in her tones. Yes, yes, indeed. I was full of joy, till I heard that one of my children had been disobeying me, bringing serious consequences upon herself and others. His countenance had grown very grave and stern. Where is Lulu? he asked, glancing about in search of her. Down on the beach with Mama and the rest, Violet answered. Can you give me a true and full account of her behavior, since I have been away? he asked. My dear husband, Violet said entreatingly, please do not ask me. "'Pardon me, dearest,' he returned. "'I should not have asked you. "'Lulu must tell me herself. "'Thankful I am that many and serious as are her faults. "'She is yet so honest and truthful "'that I can put full confidence in her word "'and feel sure that she will not deceive me, "'even to save herself from punishment.' "'I think that is high praise, "'and that Lulu is deserving of it,' remarked Violet, "'glad of an opportunity to speak a word in the child's favor. "'Captain Raymond gave her a pleased, grateful look. "'You were going to the beach, were you not?' he said. "'Then please go on. I shall follow after I have settled this matter with Lily. "'There can be no comfort for her or myself till it is settled. "'Greasy, go and tell your sister to come here to me immediately.' "'Do be as lenient as your sense of duty will allow, dear husband,' whispered Violet in his ear, "'then hastened on her way. "'Grace was lingering, gazing at him with wistful, tear-filled eyes. "'What is it?' he asked, bending down to smooth her hair caressingly. "'You should go at once, little daughter, when Papa bids.' "'I would, Papa, only—' "'Only I wanted to—to to ask you not to punish Lulu very hard.' "'I am glad my little Gracie loves her sister,' he said. "'And you need never doubt, my darling, that I dearly love both her and you. "'Go now and give her my message.' "'All day long, Lulu had kept herself as far apart from the others, "'her sister accepted, as lay in her power. "'She was sitting now in the sand alone, no one within several yards of her, "'her hands folded in her lap, while she gazed far out to sea, "'her eyes following the sail in the distant offing. Perhaps it is Papa's ship, she was saying to herself. Oh, how long will it be before we see him again? And oh, how sorry he will be when he hears about last night and this morning. At that instant she felt Grace's arms suddenly thrown around her, while the sweet child voice exclaimed in an ecstasy of delight, Oh, Lou, he has come, he has, he has! Who? Lulu asked with a start and tremble that reminded Grace of the message she had to deliver, and that Lulu's pleasure at their father's unexpected return could not be so unalloyed as her own, all which she had forgotten for the moment in the rapture of delight she herself felt at his coming. "'Papa Lulu,' she answered, sobering down a good deal. 
and I was most forgetting that he sent me to tell you to come to him immediately. Did he? Lulu asked, trembling more than before. Does he know about last night, Greasy? Did Mamma Vi tell him? He knows about it. Somebody told him before he got to Sconset, said Grace. But Mamma didn't tell him at all. He asked her, but she begged him not to please ask her. Mamma doesn't ever tell tales on us, I'm sure. No, I don't believe she does. But what did Papa say then? That you should tell him all about it yourself. You were an honest child, serious as your faults were, and lie could trust you to own the truth, even when you were to be punished for it. But, Lulu, you have to go right up to the house. Papa said immediately. Yes, Lulu replied, getting upon her feet very slowly and looking a good deal frightened. Did Papa seem very angry? I think he intends to punish you, Grace replied in a sorrowful tone. But maybe he won't if you say you're sorry. He won't do any more. But hurry, Lulu or he may punish you for not obeying promptly. Is Mamma Vi there? asked Lulu, still lingering. No, yonder she is. Don't you see? said Grace, nodding her head in the direction of the awning, under which nearly their whole party were now seated. There's nobody there but Papa. Oh, hurry, Lulu, or he will whip you, I'm afraid. Don't you ever say that before anybody, Gracie, Lulu said low and tremulously, then turned and walked rapidly toward the stairway that led up the bluff to the cottages. At a window, looking toward the bluff, the captain stood, watching for lulu's coming she is not yielding very prompt obedience to the order he said to himself but what wonder the poor child doubtless dreads the interview extremely in fact i should be only too glad to escape it it is no agreeable task to have to deal out justice to one's own child a child so lovable in spite of her faults how much easier to pass the matter over slightly merely administrating a gentle reprimand but no i cannot it would be like healing slightly the festering sore that threatens the citadel of life I must be faithful to my God-given trust, however trying to my feelings. Ah, there she is, as a little figure appeared at the top of the staircase and hurried across the intervening space to the open doorway. There she halted, trembling with downcast eyes. It was a minute or more before she ventured to lift them, and then it was a very timid glance she sent in her father's direction. He was looking at her with a very grave, rather stern countenance, and her eyes fell again, while still she shrank from reproaching him. "'You are not very glad to see me, I think,' he said, holding out his hand, but with no relaxing of the sternness of his expression. "'Oh, Papa, yes, yes, indeed I am,' she burst out, springing to his side and putting her hand in his. "'Even though I suppose you are going to punish me, just as you did the last time.' He drew her to his knee, but without offering her the slightest caress. "'Won't you kiss me, Papa?' she asked with a little sob. "'I will, but you are not to take it as a token of favor, only of your father's love that is never withdrawn from you. "'Even when he is most severe in the punishment of your faults,' he answered, "'pressing his lips again and again to forehead, cheeks, and lips. "'What have you done that you expect so severe a punishment?' "'Papa, you know, don't you?' she said, hiding her blushing face on his breast. "'I choose to have you tell me. "'I want a full confession of all the wrongdoing you've been guilty of "'since I left you the other day.' "'I disobeyed you last night, Papa, about taking a long walk by myself, "'but it was because I forgot to notice how far I was going.' At least, I didn't notice, she stammered, remembering that she had willfully refrained from doing so. You forgot? Forgot to pay attention to your father's commands? Did not think them of sufficient importance for you to take the trouble to impress them upon your mind? I cannot accept that excuse as a good and sufficient one. And, tell me honestly, are you not, as I strongly suspect, less careful to obey your father's orders when he is away, so that you fear yourself in a measure out of his reach than when he is close at hand? "'Papa, you ask such hard questions,' she said. "'Hard to my little daughter only, because of her wrongdoing. "'But hard or easy, they must be answered. "'Tell me the truth. "'Would you not have been more careful to keep within prescribed bounds last night "'if I had been at home, or had you had known that you would see me here today?' "'Yes, Papa,' she answered in a low, unwilling tone. "'I don't think anybody else can have quite so much authority over me as you, "'and, and so I do, I suppose, act a little more as if I could do as I please when you are away.' And that, after I've explained to you again and again that in my absence you are quite as much under the authority of the kind friends with whom I have placed you as under mine when I am with you, I see there is no effectual way to teach you the lesson but by punishing you for disregarding it. Then he made her give him a detailed account of her ramble of the night before and its consequences. When she had gone as far in the narrative as her safe arrival among the alarmed household, he asked whether her grandma Elsie inflicted any punishment upon her. "'No, sir,' answered Lulu, hanging her head and speaking in a sullen tone. "'I told her I didn't feel as if anybody had a right to punish me but you.' 
Lulu, did you dare to talk in that way to her? exclaimed the captain. I hope she punished you for your impertinence, for if she did not, I certainly must. She lectured me then, and this morning told me my punishment was a prohibition against wandering away from the rest, more than just a few yards. But, Papa, they were all so unkind to me at breakfast. I mean, all but Grandma Elsie and Mamma Vi and Gracie. Bessie looked sneering, and the others so cold and distant, and Rosie said something very insulting about my being a bad, troublesome child and frightening Mamma Vi into a headache. Certainly no more than you deserved, her father said. Did you bear with patience and humility as you ought? Do you mean that I must answer you, Papa? Most assuredly I do. Tell me at once exactly what you did and said. I don't want to, Papa, she said half angrily. You are never to say that when I give you an order, he returned, in a tone of severity. Never venture to do it again. Tell me, word for word, as nearly as you can remember it, what reply you made to Rosie's taunt. Papa, I didn't say anything to her. I just got up and pushed back my chair and turned to leave the table. Then Grandma Elsie asked me what I wanted. I said I didn't want anything, but would rather go without my breakfast and stay there to be insulted. Then she told me to sit down and eat, and Rosie wouldn't make any more unkind speeches. Were they all pleasant to you after that? he asked. No, Papa, they haven't been pleasant to me all today. And Uncle Hedward has said such hateful things about me and to me, she went on, her cheek flushing and her eyes flashing with anger, half forgetting in the excitement of passion, to whom she was telling her story and showing her want of self-control. And I very much fear, he said gravely, that you are both passionate and impertinent. Tell me just what passed. If I do, you'll punish me, I know you will, she burst out. Papa, don't you think it's a little mean to make me tell on myself and then punish me for what you find out in that way? If my object was merely to give you pain, I think it would be mean enough, he said, not at all unkindly. But as I am seeking your best interests, your truest happiness in trying to gain full insight into your character and conduct, meaning to discipline you only for your highest good, I think it is not mean or unkind. From your unwillingness to confess to me, I fear you must have been in a great passion and very impertinent. Is it not so? Papa, I didn't begin it. If I'd been let alone, I shouldn't have got into a passion or said anything saucy. Possibly not. But what is that virtue worth which cannot stand the least trial? You must learn to rule your own spirit, not only when everything goes smoothly with you, but under provocation, and in order to help you to learn that lesson, or rather the means toward teaching it to you. I shall invariably punish any and every outbreak of temper and every impertinence of yours that come under my notice when I am at home. Now, tell me exactly what happened between your Uncle Edward and yourself. Seeing there was no escape for her, Lulu complied, faithfully repeating every word of the short colloquy at the beach when she went down there directly after breakfast. Her father listened in astonishment, his face growing sterner every moment. Lucilla, he said, you were certainly the most impertinent, insolent child I ever saw. I don't wonder you were afraid to let me know the whole truth in regard to this affair. I am ashamed of your conduct toward both your Grandma Elsie and your Uncle Edward. You must apologize to both of them, and do, acknowledging that you have been extremely impertinent and asking forgiveness for it. Lulu made no reply. Her eyes were downcast. Her face was flushed with passion and wore a stubborn look. I won't. The words were on the tip of her tongue. She had almost spoken them, but restrained herself just in time. Her father's authority was not to be defied, as she had learned to her cost a year ago. He saw the struggle that was going on in her breast. You must do it, he said. You may write your apology, so, if you prefer that to speaking. Them. He opened a writing desk that stood on a table close at hand, and seated her before it with paper, pen, and ink, and bade her write at his dictation. She did not dare refuse, and had really no very strong disinclination to do so, in regard to the first, which was addressed to Grandma Elsie, a lady so gentle and kind, that even proud Lulu was willing to humble herself to her. But when it came to Edward's turn, her whole soul rose up in rebellion against it, yet she dared not say either, I won't, or I don't want to. But, pausing with a pen in her fingers, Papa, she began timidly, please don't make me apologize to him. He had no right to talk to me the way he did. I am not so sure of that, the captain said. I don't blame him for trying to uphold his mother's authority. And now I think of it, you are to consider yourself under his control, in the absence of your mamma and the older persons, to whom I have given authority over you. Begin at once, and write what I have told you to. When the notes were written, signed and folded, he put them in his pocket, turned and paced the floor. Lulu, glancing timidly into his face, saw that it was pale and full of pain, but very stern and determined. Papa, are you are you going to punish me? she asked tremulously. I mean, as you did the other day? 
I think I must, he said, pausing beside her. Though it grieves me to the very heart to do it. But you have been disobedient, passionate, and very impertinent. It is quite impossible for me to let you slip. But you may take your choice between that and being locked up in the bedroom there for twenty-four hours on bread and water. Which shall it be? I'd rather take the first, Papa, said Lulu promptly, because it will be over in a few minutes, and nobody but ourselves need know anything about it. I made sure you would choose the other, he said in some surprise. Yet I think your choice is wise. Come. Oh, Papa, I'm so frightened, she said, putting her trembling hand in his. You did hurt me so dreadfully the other time. Must you be as severe today? My poor child, I'm afraid I must, he said. A slight punishment seems to avail nothing in your case, and I must do all in my power to make you a good, gentle, obedient child. A few minutes later, Captain rejoined the others on the beach, but Lulu was not with him. She had been left behind in the bedroom, or she must stay, he told her, until his return. Everybody seemed glad to see him, but after greeting them all in return, he drew Violet to a seat a little apart from the others. Grace followed, of course, keeping close to her father's side. Where is Lulu, Papa? she asked with a look of concern. Up at the house. Won't you let her come down here, Papa? She loves so to be close down by the waves. She may come after a little, he said, but not just now. Then, taking two tiny notes from his pocket. Here, Gracie, he said. Take this to your Grandma Elsie, and this to your Uncle Edward. Yes, sir. Must I wait for a rep- answer? Oh, no, he replied, with a slight smile. You may come right back to your place at Papa's side. Elsie read the little missive handed her at a glance rose up hastily and went to the captain with it in her hand a troubled look on her face my dear captain she said in a tone of gentle remonstrance why did you do this the child's offence against me was not a grave one in my esteem and i know that to one of her temperament it would be extremely galling to make to apologize i wish you had not required it of her i thought it for her good mother he answered and i think so still she is so strongly inclined to impertinence and insubordination that i must do all in my power to train her to proper submission and to lawful authority and respect for superiors. Edward joined them at that moment. He looked disturbed and chagrined. Really, Captain, he said, I'm not at all sure that Lulu has not as much right to an apology from me as I to this from her. I spoke to her in anger and with an assumption of authority, to which I really had no right, so that there was no ample excuse for her not particularly respectful language to me. I am sorry, therefore, she has had the pain of apologizing. "'You are very kind to be so ready to overlook her insolence,' the captain said, "'but I cannot permit such exhibitions of temper, "'and must, at whatever cost, teach her to rule her own spirit.' "'Doubtless you are right,' Edward said, "'but I am concerned and mortified to find that I have got her into such disgrace and trouble. "'I must own that I am quite attached to Lulu. "'She has some very noble and lovable traits of character.' "'She has indeed,' said his mother. "'She is so free from the least taint of hypocrisy or deceit, "'so perfectly honest and truthful.' So warm-hearted, too, so diligent and energetic in anything she undertakes to do. Very painstaking and persevering, and a brave, womanly little thing. The captain's face brightened very much as he listened to these praises of his child. I thank you heartily, mother and brother, he said, for the child is very dear to her father's heart, and praise of her is sweet to my ear. I can see all these lovable traits, but feared that to other eyes and mine they might be entirely obscured by the very grave faults joined with them but it is just like you both to look at the good rather than the evil. And you have done so much for my children. I assure you, I often think of it with the feeling that you have laid me under obligations, which I can never repay. Ah, Captain, Elsie said laughingly, you have a fashion of making a great mountain out of a little molehill of kindness. Flattery is not good for human nature, you know. So I shall leave you and go back to Papa, who has a wholesome way of telling me of my faults and failings. "'I really don't know where he finds them,' returned Captain Raymond gallantly, but she was already out of hearing. "'Nor I,' said Violet, replying to his last remark. "'Mama seems to me to be as nearly perfect as a human creature can be in this sinful world.' "'Now don't be feeling troubled about it, Ned,' Zoe was saying to her husband, who was again at her side. "'I think it was just right that she should be made to apologize to you, for she was dreadfully saucy.' "'Yes, but I provoked her, and I ought to be, and am, greatly ashamed of it. I fear, too, that in so doing—' I have brought a severe punishment upon her. Why should you think so? Because I know that such a task could not fail to be exceedingly unpalatable to one of her temperament. And don't you remember how long she stood out against her father's authority last summer, when he bade her ask Vi's pardon for impertinence to her? Yes, it took nearly a week of close confinement to make her do it. But as he showed himself so determined in that instance, 
she probably saw that it would be useless to attempt opposition to his will in this, and so obeyed without being compelled by punishment. "'Well, I hope so,' he said. "'She surely ought to know by this time that he is not one to be trifled with.' It seemed to Lulu a long time that she was left alone, shut up in the little bedroom of the cottage, though it was in reality scarcely more than half an hour. She was very glad when, at last, she heard her father's step in the outer room, then his voice as he opened the door and asked, "'Would you like to take a walk with your papa, little girl?' "'Yes, indeed, Papa,' was her joyful reply. "'Then put on your hat and come.' She made all haste to obey. "'Is Gracie going to, Papa, or anybody else?' she asked, putting her hand confidingly into his. "'No. You and I are going alone this time. Do you think you will find my company sufficient for once?' he asked, smiling down at her. "'Oh, yes, indeed, Papa. I think it will be ever so nice to have you all to myself. It's so seldom I can.' They took the path along the bluffs toward Tom Never's head. When they had fairly left the village behind, so that no one could overhear anything they might say to each other, the captain said, "'I want to have a talk with you, daughter, and we may as well take it out here, in the sweet fresh air, a shut up in the house.' "'Oh, yes, Papa, it is so much pleasanter. I can hardly bear to stay in the house at all, down here on the seashore, and it seemed a long while that you left me there alone this afternoon.' "'Yes, I suppose so, and I hope I shall not have occasion to do so again. My child, did you ever consider—' what it is that makes you so rebellious so unwilling to submit to authority and so ready to fly into a passion and speak insolently to your superiors i don't quite understand you papa she said i only know that i can't bear to have people try to rule me who have no right sometimes you are not willing to be ruled even by your father yet i hardly suppose you would say he has no right oh no papa i know better than that she said blushing and hanging her head i know you have the best right in the world Yet sometimes you disobey me, and others obey in an angry, unwilling way that shows you would rebel if you dared. And pride is at the bottom of it all. You think so highly of yourself and your own wisdom that you cannot bear to be controlled or treated as one not capable of guiding herself. But the Bible tells us that God hates pride. Everyone that is proud in heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand joined in hand, he shall not be unpunished. Pride goes before a destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Proud and haughty scorner is his name, who dealeth in proud wrath. Ah, my dear daughter, I am sorely troubled when I reflect how often you deal in that. My great desire for you is that you may learn to rule your own spirit, that you may become meek and lowly in heart, patient and gentle like the Lord Jesus, who, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously. Do you never feel any desire to be like him? "'Yes, Papa, sometimes, and I determine that I will, "'but the first thing I know I'm in a passion again, "'and I get so discouraged that I think "'I'll not try any more to be good, for I just can't.' "'It is Satan that puts that thought in your heart,' "'the captain said, giving her a look of grave concern. "'He knows that if he can persuade you "'to cease to fight against the evil that is in your nature, "'he is sure to get possession of you at last. "'He is a most malignant spirit, "'and his delight is in destroying souls. "'The Bible bids us, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. We are all sinners by nature, and Satan, and many lesser evil spirits under him, are constantly seeking our destruction. Therefore we have a warfare to wage, if we would attain eternal life. And no one who refuses or neglects to fight this good fight of faith will ever reach heaven, nor will anyone who attempts it without asking help from on high. So if you give up trying to be good, you and I will have a sad time, because it will be my duty to compel you to try. The Bible tells me, Withhold not correction from the child, for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. Thou shalt beat him with the rod, and shalt deliver his soul from hell. I must, if possible, deliver you from going to that awful place, and also from the dreadful calamities, indulgence of a furious temper, sometimes brings even in this life. Even a woman has been known to commit murder, while under the influence of unbridled rage, and I have known of one who lamed her own child for life, in a fit of passion. Sometimes people become deranged, simply from the indulgence of their tempers. Do you think I should be a good and kind father if I allowed you to go in a path that leads to such dreadful ends, here and hereafter? No, sir, she said in an odd tone, and I will try to control my temper. I'm glad to hear that resolve, he replied. The Bible tells us, He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty, and he that ruleth his spirit than he that taketh the city. They were silent for a little while, then hanging her head and blushing. Papa, she asked, what did you do with those notes you made me write? 
Send them to those to whom they were addressed. And they were very kind, Lulu, much kinder than you deserve they should be. Both your Grandma Elsie and your Uncle Edward expressed regret that you had been made to apologize and spoke of you in affectionate terms. I'm glad, she said with a sigh of relief, and I don't mean ever to be at all impertinent to them again. I trust you will not indeed, he said. Papa, I think this is about where I was the other evening, when I first noticed that the storm was coming. A long way from home for a child of your age, especially alone and at night. You must not indulge your propensity for wandering to a distance from home by yourself. You are too young to understand the danger of it. Too young to be a guide to yourself. You must therefore be content to be guided by older and wiser people. You said a little while ago, I just can't be good. Did you mean to assert that you could not help being disobedient to me that evening? She hung her head and colored deeply. It was so pleasant to walk along looking at the beautiful changing sea, Papa, she said, that I couldn't bear to stop and wouldn't let myself think how far I was going. Ah, just as I suspected, your could not was really would not, the difficulty all in your will. You must learn to conquer your will when it would take you in the wrong direction. We will turn and go back now, as it is not far from tea time. Lulu shrank from meeting the rest of their party, particularly Grandma Elsie and Edward, but they all treated her so kindly that she was soon at her ease among them again. End of chapter 9 Recording by Amy